um, December the 26th, Boxer Day, the day after Christmas. And <clears throat> so I thought it would be appropriate today to talk about how Jesus grew up. <clears throat> and um, we had in the uh, Advent sermons things from December 25th is actually really the day he was born. He was conceived March 25th. That's the actual incarnation, March 25th. And how the early church uh, taught that, particularly in the West, and how the Eastern church researched it and found that out, and how the Roman records confirmed that. And, <clears throat> and then we talked about different aspects, the fullness of time uh, for Christ, and, and the difference between the account in Luke and the account in, in Matthew. And just to reiterate that for a moment, because we're going to largely stay in, in Luke today, although I'll be going all over the place. Um, Luke <clears throat> has as his theme the fact that the Son of God, the Messiah, fulfills the son of man aspect fully human he's the second adam and he successfully resists sin he doesn't sin his whole life so he can be a pure redemptive passover for the entire human race matthew his theme is that jesus fulfills the jewish king the promised king out of the line of david not that there aren't overlaps, but though that's particular to these two. And, and so Matthew focuses on certain things that, that Luke focuses on, on other things. And so just that is, as a background, <clears throat> I want to get into the Luke account. And there are different words used. Brethos, which means that he's a newborn infant. Pideon, which means that he's, a, he's from that infant stage up through the little child stage. Finally, when we get to when he's 12 years old, he's called a, a pice, a boy. And uh, at 13, he would become a son of the law, the bar mitzvah. And then he becomes a man, and not only a man, but he becomes, at the age of about 30, he becomes um, a prophet, a priest, a ruler, a teacher. Remember, he was born a king. This is not the child that was to be king. The three wise men came and said, where is he who is born the king of the Jews? They didn't see where is he who is born our king? They're Gentiles. They had the training of Daniel in Babylon and they could read in the stars and from the teaching of Babylon from 600 BC on, they, they understood this Messiah would come out of these Jewish people and they said, where is he who was born the king of the Jews? Not our king, the king of the Jews because they knew that he was going to be the savior of the world. Born a king, and he dies a king at the testimony of Pontius Pilate, of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, this is what the Holy Spirit is screaming to us, is that the Roman Empire who's in charge declares he is the king of the Jews. <clears throat> when we get into the Q&A on Tuesday nights, until we get a, another subject, there, there can be a lot of questions about all the things that were going on around this time or in church history. But it's amazing how God has orchestrated this dynamic testimony from the establishment, from the swamp, if you will, about the truth of who this person was. Well, how did he grow up? I am um, saddened to see throughout history so many Christians who almost see Jesus as this superman 
that, that bullets would bounce off of, and, and, and he just sort of, he's a cardboard character. He just walks through life, and this is all sort of a, an act. Because he's, there's so much emphasis on, on the Son of God aspect that, that the human aspect is, is almost ignored. Now, in the early church, that was considered heretical. The early church, more than any church time in history, emphasized that he had to be fully human, fully alive, or the Passover sacrifice meant nothing. So how did this boy grow up into the man that he became? <clears throat> oh, a little background. Nazareth has been underrated. If I were a travel agency, I would just jump at the opportunity to tell you what Nazareth was really about. Nazareth was this community, this town in Galilee, north of Jerusalem, <clears throat> about 90 miles by foot. And it was really a stronghold of the descendants of King David. It was a stronghold of the descendants of King David. They were both in Bethlehem and up in Nazareth. And some of them lived in, uh, in caves, believe it or not, and, and some in homes. You say, why caves? Were they cavemen? Well, they were cavemen and women, but it wasn't because they were less developed. They, it was an ecological thing. The, the, it was a very inexpensive way to have your animals at the front for heat when it got cold, to live in the back. It was just a marvelous opportunity. And it was better than the crowded conditions in the town. And, and it was more sanitary. So they lived in, in caves and in houses in, in Nazareth. And by the way, in, in scripture where it calls him a Nazarene, it actually comes, we, we, we found archaeologically, that it comes from a Hebrew term for the name of that city, Nazareth. And so he would be called a Nazarene. That was dug up in 1962, but it, it gets no press. Now, Mary was born in Sepphoris. It's a city in the Decapolis, that is a Gentile area up in Galilee or by Galilee. <clears throat> and she had no brothers. So rich in tradition, and she was a descendant of David too. David, King David, was married, among other women, to Bathsheba. And through Solomon, you get Joseph, who had no part in the birth. But through David and Bathsheba's son, Nathan, not the prophet, but the son, Nathan, through that line, you get Mary, of whom Jesus was born. So they're both Davidic. And what's really interesting is that they wouldn't have been poor. They wouldn't have been poor because they would be going to Bethlehem in a combination of enrollment and possible taxation because they would have had property there, both. both. And the Roman law, not the Jewish law, the Roman law required if it was a woman with property and she would have inherited because she had no brothers, it required the woman to have a male guardian. It could be her husband. And he was legally her husband as the betrothed. So that's why when she's nine months pregnant, she's making the trip to Bethlehem with Joseph. We think of it the other way around. We think of it as Joseph having to go there, which he did, because he also was of David and had possessions there. But so did she. And somebody points out that the, uh, the two turtle doves that were offered from Leviticus uh, for the birth of the male child, 
that um, that was for the poor. It was for the poor. I'm going to get into that in just a minute. But they weren't poor. But you could offer the two turtle doves. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> during this time, these two are going down to Bethlehem that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And that's how God orchestrates your life and my life. He didn't make them go. The Romans made them go. But he didn't make them go. He orchestrated the events. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. He, he is working like this in the lives of people who hate him to get them to turn to him. He says he only gets satisfaction from people who turn to him and are saved. And Jesus said there's more rejoicing in heaven over one wicked sinner who repents than you can imagine. At any rate, they go down there. And in Jerusalem, I need to tell you a little bit about Jerusalem. Jerusalem was unlike any other city in Israel. It had the power structure there. And they had completely perverted scripture in regard to women. In the Old Testament, you read of a woman in Proverbs 31 who is the chief operating officer of her family. She buys and sells land. She imports. She exports. She's in charge of the education of the children, of the servants, of hiring and firing. She's the chief operating officer. You don't have that at this time in history in Jerusalem. They have completely perverted it. The high priest's wife would have to stay inside his little palace her whole life, for the most part. They were even covered on the inside. One of the high priests had a wife who was famous for being religious. And before she died, she was able to say that none of her sons, none of her servants, not even the beams of the house ever saw her hair. That's how covered she was. And you might think that they were very religious at that time. They weren't. Jesus was born into a time in which the faith in Israel had been almost totally corrupted. I was sharing with some people the other day that one of the wives of the priests, <clears throat> when the priest died, she was complaining because they only gave her in her allowance, one gallon of wine per day for herself. She complained, it's not enough. Well, when you consider how they lived, it probably wasn't enough. <clears throat> Give you an example of another one. Another one was complaining that her allowance for luxuries was only, only 400 times the average daily wage per day, per day. So let me translate this for you. The average daily wage at the time of Jesus was one denarius. Our average daily wage of a laborer would be about $120 a day, roughly. So in today's dollars, her allowance that she complained about was $50,000 a day. And she was paid in gold every day. That's how wealthy these Pharisees, these scribes, these Sadducees, that's how wealthy these people were. <clears throat> One more thing before I get into how Jesus grew up. There had the prophets had been replaced 
The prophets had been replaced by a system of seminaries. And the seminary training is where you had an expert in the law who would teach you a system of approaching issues and problems. And they separated the clergy from the laity severely. N not like this in the Old Testament. There was such a separation that only, that only if you were in this elite group could you get in-depth teaching. And if you were in this other group, you would just sort of maintain, do your sacrifices and, uh, and, and go on and, and pay us our money and, and tithe and everything and <clears throat> you're not worth our time. And that, that's why, by the way, in Acts, when, when, when the um, scribes and the Pharisees and the officials of the temple are complaining about the apostles, they're saying they're unlearned men. That means they haven't had this, this special seminary education. <clears throat> so Jesus is born into a very subtle, perverted, corrupt Jewish society that's dominated by the strongest of the empires, Rome. So that would be like growing up in, in China today. North Korea, China, Russia. And, and the subset, Israel, they were perverted in the way they treated women, in the way they treated the poor, in the way they taught the Bible, in their own manner of life. So, <clears throat> what happens is that Joseph and Mary make sure that Jesus is circumcised on the eighth day and then that uh, all of the purification and offerings are, are done. And I, I said, I, I would explain the, the, two, the two doves. In Jerusalem, the two doves cost 100 times more than two doves would cost in Nazareth or in Caesarea or Beersheba or some other place in Israel, 100 times more. They were traveling. They could be robbed. They were on a budget. They couldn't go to an ATM. So it wasn't a matter of being poor. It was a matter of being practical. Anyway, after the 40 days, um, the wise men come and they do the adoration to Jesus. They're not there really at the time of the shepherds. And I want to add this detail <clears throat> while he's this little child referred to as a brephos in the manger, newborn, and as a paideon when the, when the wise men come, the three kings to the house. I want to add this little detail. When they take him to the temple for presentation, you have the prophetess Anna and you have um, Simeon who prophesies over him. And I, I want to point out something that the Catholics get right and the Protestants fail on. And that is that there is a special relationship between Jesus and his mother. Not only is 100% of his DNA due to her, and none from Joseph, who, who, who Joseph couldn't have had any DNA, because A, it carries the sin nature through the male, not through the female. I, I, that may come as a shock to wives, but the, you know, you who are used to calling your husband Lord, what do you want to... <clears throat> but um, uh, yes, the sin nature is passed down through the male. But in addition, there was a curse on the Solomon side of the line. W one of the kings had done something so bad, God said, any descendant from you uh, cannot reign on my throne. So had Jesus had Joseph take part in, in his reproduction, he would not have been allowed to be king of the Jews. It's that simple. 
at any rate, <clears throat> there was a special relationship. And that's why you see in Luke chapter 2, and this is um, interesting, in Luke chapter 2, about verse 31 through 35, that even though his parents, Joseph and Mary, come, the prophecy is specifically to Mary. It said that it's to Mary. He spoke it to Mary. And what's also interesting is it says that these things she hid in her heart. It doesn't say that about Joseph. It doesn't say he had he hid these things in her. Now, I'm not saying Joseph was not a believer, but what I'm saying is there was a special relationship. And in this prophecy about Jesus, one of the things that comes out that's different from what the wise men said, that's different from what the angels told the shepherds is he's going to be a divider. This is where Jesus later in his ministry says, I bring a sword. I divide a family, two against three and three against two about belief in him. And this prophecy about this little baby is that's going to be for the falling and the rising of many. And you, Mary, your soul is going to be pierced at all of this stuff that's going on. So Joseph has a dream and has to flee to Egypt. Egypt, the Egypt border is about 70 miles away. They're there for a couple of months, not a couple of years, a couple of months. And then Herod dies and he's warned by the angel to go back to Nazareth. Now, what you've heard in standard evangelical preaching is that Nazareth is more of a, a town, a backwoods area, country life. And that couldn't be further from the truth. You say, where do you get this information? I get it from archaeology, patristics, and secular Roman records, Tacitus, Suetonius, on and on and on. And it's available. Um, people don't study it. Sephorus was a city that rebelled and it was put down and burned by the Romans. And they were rebuilding it when Herod the Great was a king. And they were rebuilding it as, as, a, as a splendid city to Augustus and Rome. And it had a, a theater that, that sat 5,000. And there were all kinds of building projects going on. This was four miles from the home of Joseph and Mary. Four miles. And Joseph was a tecton. He was <coughs> a skilled mason, a skilled carpenter, a skilled cabinet maker, a, a skilled bricklayer. A tecton was a skilled builder. He could do everything. And they were also literate. He was part, really, of an elite profession. And you were obligated to take your son into your trade. So from the time that Jesus was little, they would have been part of the building, the rebuilding of this magnificent city of Sepphoris. They spoke Aramaic in Nazareth. And they spoke Greek and they spoke Latin. Why would you speak Latin when you're Jews? Who are your captors? The Romans. If you're going to do any business as the Roman army comes in, they want you to build something. They want to buy something. They want to sell something. You have to be able to speak their language. And the international language was Greek. Jesus grew up speaking Aramaic, Greek and Latin. Trilingual fluently and building the Jews by the way 
used to go to the theater. On, on some of the theaters, it would have rows reserved for Jews. You know that phrase where Jesus says to Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? Remember, Paul is persecuting the church, right? This is Acts chapter 9. Paul is persecuting the church. And Jesus says, you're persecuting me. And Paul says, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you persecute us. Why are you kicking against the goads, right? He, Jesus is actually <laughs> quoting Aeschylus, a Greek writer, in one of his plays. It's, it, it became famous, used by the other Greek playwrights, even by the Jewish uh, playwright. Aeschylus wrote this in 500 B.C., and it became a byword. Don't kick against the goats. What it's, it's, it's what we say, don't, don't do what, bite off your nose to spite your face or something like that. You know, that, that kind of thing. You're, you're hurting yourself, Paul, by what you're doing. You're so zealous for the truth, but you're killing the truth and killing yourself. My point is that Jesus grew up in this environment of Greek dramatists, Greek literature, Roman literature, Jewish literature. He also knew Hebrews in order to read the scriptures. Now, what's really interesting is there is a commentary on the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Bedamar Rabbah, chapter 14. <clears throat> and it talks about when the Messiah comes... When the Messiah comes, he will be taught of Jehovah. He's not going to go to some ordinary seminary. He's not going to learn from Moses or Ezra or Jeremiah or Isaiah. <coughs> He's going to be taught directly by Jehovah. And they went on to say, that he's going to have more wisdom and more understanding than all the patriots, than all the prophets combined. So what's interesting is that when Jesus is born at the fullness of time, in the right place, at the right time, under the right empire, to fulfill all, all prophecy, not only do the Jews at this time the ones who are complaining about only a gallon of wine to drink a day. Not only are they ignoring that, but soon after they change the whole chrono their whole chronology. They change it by a hundred and some odd years so that it doesn't point to Christ. And they admit it in the 20th century. This, this was why they received him not. They didn't want him to come and take away their place, their power under this occupation by, by Rome. So, so Jesus is growing up, not in some backwoods little place. And as he says in John chapter 8, verse 29, he said that from his whole life, God the Father has been with him, teaching him. So you say, okay, why is this not a, a Superman type person walking through life? Why is it not a cardboard hero? Because he had to do this as a human. He had to learn the languages as you and I have to learn them. He had to work by the sweat of his brow. His own family did not believe in him. His brothers and sisters did not believe in him, it says. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7. He is the second Adam. Adam and Eve are made perfect. They don't have sin. And in a very short time in the Garden of Eden, they are, they are tested, they are tempted, and they rebel against God. Eve was deceived, but still to blame. But the full responsibility fell on the man. On Adam it says he was not deceived and he rebelled anyway 
I don't know what kind of deal Jehovah had with Satan, but think about it. Jesus doesn't come full born for a short period of time, is tested by Satan for three possible chances to sin, passes it, and then everything's okay. He's having to grow up as a baby, as a toddler, as a child. He's not respected by his brothers and sisters. They even make fun of him. They say, you know, you want all this truth to go out. Why don't you, why don't you go to this Feast of Tabernacles and, and present yourself so that they're going to be impressed with you? Isn't that what you want? King David's older brothers made fun of him. Jesus shared that same kind of thing. And, and when he now is 12 years old and they're at the Passover and he's answering questions and asking questions, he amazed these seminarians. I mean, these were brilliant people. They were brilliant people. And here's a 12 year old who's amazing them because not only of his grasp of the Bible, but his penetrating insight and application because that's how they ask and answer questions. You would take this precept and say, how does it apply in this situation? And he amazed them. Now, I remember when I said that Joseph and Mary were from a Davidic group up in Nazareth. They're on a caravan on the way back. They don't notice that Jesus isn't with them because there are several families there and lots of kids. And at 12 years old, he could have been with the women and children. And at 12 years old, he could have been with the men and the young men. And so on the second day, when they make camp, they discover he's not really there. And they go back that whole day, and it takes a day to find him in the temple. And he says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Talk about courtesy, respect, and truth. Love and truth. Love and truth. And it says he returned with his mom and dad in complete subjection. He was more mature than they were. I'm sure he knew more than they did by the time he was 12. But his life was an ordinary life. He worked, he worked with Joseph. He studied, he prayed. He dealt with brothers and sisters who didn't think he was special. And the Bible is careful to point out that in this daily activity, the one who was hiding it in their heart about what was going on was Mary. It only mentions Mary. And as he's getting older, <clears throat> they began to wonder about how sane he is. There's one point when he does become a man that the Gospel of Mark actually says that his, his mother and his brothers and sisters were out there and they thought he was insane. He was out of his mind. By what he was saying so here's the mom <clears throat> she's seen Gabriel not a dream she's seen Gabriel she becomes pregnant without intimacy with a human father she has seen everything that's taken place after they're married all the revelation comes to Joseph not to Mary honoring the husband but she's the spiritual one. She's hiding it in her heart. And they go, and Joseph's not with them because he's dead by this time. He dies at some point before he begins his ministry. And his mom, who knows all this stuff, who's seen all this stuff, and his brothers and sisters think he's out of his mind. It's, it's the Greek word for insane. And what I'm using that for, even though he's in his ministry there in Mark, is that, do you think it was any easier when he was 18, 19, 20, 21?
So if we feel <clears throat> things are hard, if we feel we're misunderstood, if we feel all these different kinds of things that we do in this modern, technological, fast, hands-off society, more and more people are into their own thing. It's right in front of their face. Their iPad, their smartphone, their TV, their whatever, their computer. That society was every bit as challenging. And Jesus had to be perfect, perfect in love, perfect in motive, perfect in obedience to God while being completely obedient to mom and dad and brothers and sisters being respectful and getting along. And you think that he didn't know how corrupt the rabbi was? The temple? The scribes, the Pharisees, the church, he knew how corrupt it was. And he went there and he went there and he attended. And he was respectful. He grew up and the book of Hebrews says he was tempted in every way as you and I are tempted. That means he was tempted for fame, he was tempted for power, he was tempted for finance, for money, for wealth, he was tempted for sex. He's 13 year old boy, you don't think he can recognize a pretty girl? But it said he was absolutely perfect. And that word means that you have perfect motivation you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and truth. Jesus grew up every bit as human as you or I, and that's why he was able to offer himself as a sinless sacrifice that you and I might have life. And I leave you with this question today. If you had any member in your family do this for you. If you had any friend that you count, maybe even closer to than your family, do this for you. What would you give in return? God bless you all. Amen and amen.